see the screen right now. Um, and we are going to get this show on the road. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey Pearson. I've got Maddie Burras here too on our marketing team. Uh, we're having some fun technical challenges alternating the microphone back and forth between us. Uh, but from what I can tell, I'm getting an all systems go thumbs up. So um, if you obviously if you have any challenges, use the chat here within the go to webinar portal, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll spread things away. Uh, but we're here today to talk about customer metrics driving retail growth. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Corey Pearson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Castora. And uh, we're really excited to talk to you guys today about some of the research we did. Uh, we work with a whole bunch of retailers, large and small, and pretty much every single sub-vertical of retail you can imagine. And uh, we put a lot of time into analyzing, we work with our customers at, at the highest, highest level. We help these retail brands uh, leverage their customer data to drive growth. And in doing so, we spend a lot of time focusing on customer metrics and which customer metrics really matter. And so today we're gonna to share a lot of details about um, you know, the, 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 the findings of that research. So we can share with you, if you were to focus on one or two metrics that really might move the needle for your brand, which ones are they? Uh, so the data here, uh, we've analyzed data of over 100 brands, including some of the biggest well-known retailers in the country, uh, tens of billions, over $100 billion in annual transaction volume, multiple years of, of data, uh, hundreds of millions of shopper accounts across these brands. So it's, it's a very comprehensive data set. Um, you, you know, you can imagine some of the retailers on the screen you see right there are their traditional online offline brands, as well as some of the fastest growing online only brands. So we're really covering the gamut here as we look for which of those customer metrics out there are the ones that truly help a brand drive growth. And it's a question, you know, some of this might be a little bit obvious, but you know, why the reason for so much focus on customers you know, the backdrop for all of this research and the backdrop for a lot of the work that we do at Castora is that we all recognize that retail has dramatically changed over the past 10 years. People buy on their phones, people buy on the, on the subway now at Internet Underground. Uh, people have very short attention spans. I'm going to feel flattered if a good chunk of you make it to the end of this webinar. Uh, we have so much choice to buy. The list goes on, and, and we all know this, um, but as the technology has exploded, as mobile shopping has exploded, as just the buying habits and creating loyalty is harder and harder, it, it puts retailers in a really tough spot. And so we all read the news, and we know of the retailers that weren't necessarily able to get in front of these changes. Uh, a lot of folks refer to you know, the retail apocalypse, and how do we keep up with Amazon? But at the same time, there have been some retailers that have been able to stay ahead of the curve. And we, you can think across the industry of some of these gold star examples. And you have companies like Zara that realized that there were customer needs and they wanted to be more responsive to the changing needs in fashion. And so they essentially introduced the concept of fast fashion driven by this desire to be faster, to be responsive to customer needs. You have brands like Nike who speak publicly about the tools they're building and the ways that they want to leverage data to deepen customer relationships, a primary focus on their loyalty members. And Nike as a brand has done very well over the years. Uh, obviously, Amazon is the bane of many uh, retail uh, marketer existence, but you look into Amazon and you see their obsession with, you know, one of the very core principal values at Amazon in their customer obsessed ways um, is to drive that wonderful customer experience, right? That the amazing fact that I could go online right now with Amazon now have something delivered by the time this webinar is over. It's amazing. Uh, you look at the way that they leverage data and how much of their, purchases are driven from the people who bought this also buy that cross-sell recommendation. So again, you know, common thread of all of these companies is that they're very obsessed with what customers want and keeping up with what customers want. And we like to refer to those companies as being customer obsessed. 
customer centric. In other words, same thing, right? But these brands that just live and breathe, not just when they say, hey, we love our customers. Of course, everyone puts the customer first, but that truly orient their organizations built organizationally from the technology to the way, you know, the metrics that they measure internally around the customer. And some uh, folks with a even, you know, much bigger, more expansive uh, research prowess than a company like Castora, these are some stats from McKinsey that talk about these firms that are really truly leverage customer analytics and customer data to drive growth. And they consistently outperform their peers in profit, in revenue, in the ROI of the investments that they make. So wrapping that all up, you know, what does it mean in practice when we think about the customer obsessed organization and what kinds of things do they do differently? Uh, they ask questions like the ones we see on the screen, right? It's customer acquisition is not only a game of how many customers can we acquire, but how can we acquire more high value, long lasting customers? Uh, not all conversions are the same, right? We kind of respect the customer journey and think a lot about things like how do we convert one-time buyers into repeat customers? And when we look at a challenge like that, no, it's not as simple as what is the post-purchase trigger going to be? You don't win a, a one to two-time buyer conversion simply by having a single post-purchase post message. You're building a relationship. It takes a series of communications to truly win that ever important second purchase. You hear executives talking about things like customer churn and how to reduce customer churn without just simply dowsing customers in promotions. Uh, lots of talk about customer metrics, lots of planning around driving improvement in customer metrics and uh, something in the DNA about embedding customer metrics throughout the whole organization. It's not just personalization. It's not just the post-purchase trigger. It's the call center. It's the way the product and merchandising team are listening to customer needs when they're planning, you know, next season's product launches and product buys. It's, it's really a, a completely thorough, exhaustive and expansive application of customer analytics everywhere that drives these companies to that competitive advantage. And that is a very long winded introduction um, to the research that we did. And so when we looked at customer metrics, um, they kind of fell into a few categories, right? As we did this research study and we started thinking to ourselves, okay, if I am a CMO or if I am a marketing leader at a company, you know, um, what are the types of customer metrics that most brands are familiar with today? And this is not an exhaustive list, but most of the primary metrics fall into these buckets. So there are customer acquisition metrics. Uh, Specifically in our research, obviously with brands of different shapes and sizes, we couldn't just look at a flat number of how many customers did you acquire, but you can look at the rate of change. Is acquisition up year over year? Are we acquiring more customers this year compared with last year? Uh, another bucket of metrics fall into, okay, when customers are here in our store or in the virtual you know, checkout process, uh, how much are they putting in that basket? What's the average order value? Uh, how often do they come to our store and or our website? What's the order frequency? And then you get into these metrics that are actually fairly complicated when you get under the surface. But for the purposes of this study, we took what are, are kind of industry standard ways of looking at things like retention and reactivation. But for the retention rate, we kind of said, look, if you look at the last 12 months, um, uh, you rewind the clock, to, you know, how, how many users make orders in back to back 12 month periods, right? So rewind your clock 24 months, who ordered in that upcoming year, you know, 24 to 12 months ago. And of that group, how many also ordered this year? Now, big, big caveat there is you could do retention a whole lot better, right? And, 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 I, and I'd be remiss to not go into that detail a little bit, but your best customers probably buy more than once a year and using a, a flat 12 month rule, it's, it's kind of bad, right? You, you really want to reach out to a customer that buys every week. Boy, if they don't shop for three or four weeks, that's, that's uh-oh, right? So there are much better ways to, to think about things like retention and churn. But for the purposes of a, of a cross-brand study and just to use metrics that are already floating around in organizations, we use that sort of repeat rate of, of the people who bought last year, how many also bought this year. And reactivation, kind of similar. Again, there's much better, more precise ways to do this. You could totally give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about helping your brand do that. But for the purposes of this research, what we looked at is of the folks maybe who ordered in the past but didn't order last year, 
and then we kind of re-engaged them in the most recent 12 months, right? So there was a big 12 month gap, but then we got them re-engaged. What percentage of the users are there? And, and we, what we did is we looked, we work with brands who are focused on all of these. You know, sometimes we get in the CMO war room and it's all about acquisition. Sometimes it's all about, hey, when we get them into our store, we've got to find ways to cross sell and upsell in the store and drive AOV. Sometimes the whole goal of the marketing team is, look, today customers come 1.4 times a year, we want to make it 1.5, right? Or, boy, we're this well-established brand, but we're losing our customers. We've got this leaky bucket, we need to plug it. Or, God, we used to have so many customers. Instead of going to find brand new users, we're going to reacquire some of these lots. We're going to reactivate customers. We've seen brands with each of these five areas being like, you know, the pinnacle of the company strategy for, for the duration of the year. And so we really zoomed into these things and we ran some, some really interesting statistics. I mean, it probably goes without saying that at surface level, improving any of these metrics is a really good thing, right? So obviously any of these things are going to move the needle in a positive way. Um, but what got more interesting for us is when we started looking at um, things like the uh, multivariate analysis on these. You can imagine that we had a way to kind of create a, uh, for those of you who are into regressions, right, you can think of the coefficient in front of each of these metrics. Um, what was more interesting to us, we know that by improving any of these is going to help the brand, but, you know, which of these is really driving the impact of growth and which of these are along for the ride? And again, maybe I'll pause because the concept of, you know, a simple regression and a multivariate regression makes a lot of sense to some of you and maybe for some of you, not so much. But sometimes when you throw a whole bunch of variables into a study like this, you're doing a macro study and you're trying to figure out what moves the needle. Uh, you can imagine that in something like this, when all of them are helpful, you know, like which of them, if you can only do one of them, is it like truly moving the needle? And, and sometimes I, I like analogies. And this isn't a perfect analogy, but like if you think about a sports team like the Chicago Bulls way back when, you know, Michael Jordan's, you know, arguably the best, one of the best NBA players ever. And they won so many championships. So you could do uh, an analysis of which players lead to championships and pretty much anyone on that team would, would pop, right? As like, well, look, they're correlated with wins. They must be great. But we all know that the driving force there was Michael Jordan. The other ones were along for the ride. I kind of think of multivariate, and I'm way over simplifying things, but I kind of think of multivariate analysis in that in that way. So, like, which of these things is the Michael Jordan of growth would be another way to, to kind of talk about it. Um, to the statisticians out there, I apologize for oversimplifying things, but but that was kind of the the real thing that we were looking for here because that to us would inform that recommendation of look, every company is unique, but by and large, rule of thumb, this is what you want to focus on. Um, by the way, if there are any questions, you can shoot them into the, the, the chat here in the, in the go to webinar thing and uh, we will have a, a bunch of time for Q&A, how we did the study, what we do, all that kind of good stuff later. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So actually, before we even do the big reveal of what, um, what our research turned out to be the case, uh, we have this little nifty poll, which I'm going to launch if I can do it. And there we go. I think that worked. So um, now you get to choose. Which of these things do you think have the strongest correlation, are the biggest drivers of growth? And I will give, you know, we'll let this run for like a minute and then we'll keep rocking. Give it another 15 seconds. I don't know why I picked the Chicago Bulls. I should have picked the Philadelphia Eagles. They're a much better, better story, but next time. All right, cool. Got my obligatory Philadelphia Eagles plug-in. I will close up this poll, and it looks like I'm going to share the results here. What we've got here is 
the group here, if you can see this poll, uh, retention rate was the winner for what the, uh, the audience said. It was 43%, 31% think order frequency, 15% are that the customer acquisition rate of growth is increasing, and 9% on AOV, 2% on reactivating lapsed customers. So thank you for that. And now we'll get in. So what is driving growth? Well, when we did this analysis, we got like a process of elimination here. First of all, these three were the ones in the multivariate that were the big contributors, order frequency, average order value, and um, the uh, rate of customer acquisition growing. And so I think the population on the on the whole uh, got some of these right, but some of these wrong. You know, big, big focus in the audience was retention rate. And it is true that for some brands, retention is a huge problem, but actually that didn't pop as, and again, just to be clear, yes, improving your retention rate is a very, very good thing. But in terms of what's driving the majority of the growth, and maybe put another way is, it's really hard to improve retention rate on its own, right? You're not gonna win customer retention simply by having, you know, fix all of your retention goals simply by having a you know, really smart win back program. It helps, it moves the needle. But that's not enough to truly impact that retention rate significantly enough. It fixing some of these things, on the other hand, does. And so the number one driver of growth in our research um, is actually order frequency. And so for every 1% increase in order frequency, we saw a corresponding 2.8% increase in revenue. And so I'm gonna pause here because men, it can be really confusing to talk about multivariate analysis. So I'm gonna pause and just talk about that a little bit more, right? Because um, you've probably read the studies that say like, hey, a 1% improvement in retention can lead to a 5% improvement in revenue. There's all kinds of good studies around that stuff. And this, this is not disputing that. But what we're kind of saying is, hey, look, you know, anytime you saw a 1% improvement in retention, it was always coupled by 1% increase in frequency, right? It was very rare to see companies where their only goal was, I'm just gonna fix this leaky bucket. And, and they achieved that and that drove growth, right? What we did see were lots of brands where they did improve the retention rate, but they also improved order frequency. And I think if we step back, sometimes we as marketers, we can have this tendency to really think of things on a micro level, like, well, to fix retention, gotta hit the win back trigger. Okay, fix one or two time buyer, I gotta get the one time buyer trigger. It's a very conversion uh, based, it's a very kind of micro mindset of things. But in fact, the best way to improve retention is to get and keep your customers engaged, right? And so um, you saw on the previous slide, customer acquisition. In fact, if we dug a layer deeper, brands that were acquiring high value customers, those customers that tend to have high purchase frequency, or, you know, that's the primary driver of a lot of that customer acquisition stuff, not just in the, um, not just in the, in the volume of, of acquisition. And so by and large, what I would say is um, it, there's kind of a high level theme here and it's sometimes hard to translate that into action. We'll talk about the series of strategies that then kind of help get this. But one of the things that we often prescribe is there is no single magic bullet. There is no single tiny way, you know, like order frequency is kind of representative of engagement and how often do people come and nothing beats that as king. So like think about the different activities you're doing as having this cumulative impact of you're finding good customers who are gonna order a lot. You know, you're keeping folks engaged so they keep ordering a lot. You're reactivating folks hopefully so that they order a lot. But it's really that ordering a lot that's going to drive the growth, which, you know, when you say it that way, kind of does make sense at a, at a high level. So let me keep going. Um, so I just said that I'm going to keep going. So, so what are some things that we see? You know, when I talk about the suite of tactics that drive that engagement, again, defining engagement with the hard stuff that these people make multiple visits to my store every year. And another little caveat, but um in you know when we talk about engagement the most powerful engagement is when your customer pulls out the credit card or the wallet full of cash and hands you you know swipes it or hands you money right that is the point in which they are true no, no engagement no like no share 
no user generated photo. All those things are great. And they, and they build fanaticism and all those wonderful things. But the true thing that drives growth obviously is, is the purchase. And so when we see these brands that are customer obsessed and, and that take that mindset and they want to attack something like driving an increase in frequency, um, here's just a few, and I'll talk about even, even a couple more that aren't on the slide here of the things that drive it. And so, uh, but, but again, to emphasize what I would say here is it's not enough to do one of these things, right? We as marketing technology vendors sometimes fall trap and that, oh boy, do we have a great affinity segmentation tool. Affinity segmentation is going to, you know, add 10% revenue growth. No, no, it's not. It's not. The sum of all of these things could, can lead to an increase in engagement, which really drives growth. But, but each one of these specific things has to be thought of as part of like an arsenal. Um, so affinity segmentation, uh, and we bring these things up, these are some examples where we see there's, there's usually really big improvement to take a significant order of magnitude step from the status quo to do something better. So oftentimes when we work with retailers, for good reason, the merchandising team is very, very powerful at the retail company. Right? We're buying products and we have to sell products. But what tends to happen, we once made a puppet show video about this. If you dig through our resources on the site, it's called Merchant Marky. It's really fun. But you get the marketing team that's got this great marketing calendar. We're going to send this great campaign to our users on Wednesday, introducing in-season products and all kinds of cool stuff. And a merch team comes down the hall and they're like, oh man, we did not sell enough of our cashmere socks. We've got to push more cashmere socks. And a lot of marketers get frustrated sometimes because they have to throw their their email that was there out the window, nobody gets that, and everybody in the population gets an email with a giant cashmere sock on it. Uh, the problem with that is not everyone in the user population likes cashmere, but their merch team, for decent reason, again, did need to push those cashmere socks. It's taking up shelf space, it's bad for the brand. But there's a better way, right? When you can give your marketers the ability to say, hey, I do need to push these cashmere socks. I've got 10,000 of them left on the shelf. So maybe let me find the 50,000 customers or 100,000 customers that have the strongest affinity to cashmere. Cool. Now I can use that audience and target them with the cashmere socks, but the other 4 million users on my email list that we know have no affinity to cashmere, maybe they can still get that beautiful email that we, um, that we crafted. And now we have like everybody's happy, right? Like the rest of the population is going to see things. They're going to convert better. There's no way they were buying the cashmere. And the people that had a chance to buy the cashmere, like, you know, they got that email and, and it kind of helps you hit those merch goals and helps you hit your goals to just drive engagement anyway. It's, it's one of those things that we find that there's often very little optimization done around these calendar driven, the integrated marketing calendar events. There's often a place to layer in really smart segmentation that enables you to not necessarily go brute force. And the end result of that is, Customers are seeing things that are more relevant. Therefore, they're going to make more purchases, right? But that's just one piece. You can shift over to the way we think about the lifecycle marketing, you know, the life, customer lifecycle, new buyers. I talked about one to two time buyers. I talked about earlier today, like customer churn, right? We know, think of, think of it this way too. Again, if we think customer obsessed, for most brands out there, the top 10% of your existing user base is going to account for over half of your the revenue of your existing users you know, next year, right? Every single retail brand works this way. A hot, a, there's a lot of concentration in your best customers. Those best customers tend to purchase a lot. That's why order frequency is the number one driver of growth, right? So for a customer that buys a couple times a month, do you really want to wait 90 days or 365 days? Right? We work with some brands that put so much energy into a loyalty program, a win back program for their VIP customers and the program doesn't start until they're quiet for 365 days. You're taking your users who are the most frequent purchasers, allowing them to go shop at your competitors. They're way off their usual purchase cadence with you. They, it's like you're giving them time to like marry the competitor. Right? You really want to be very well timed when you reach out, you want to know when that weekly shopper has missed two and a half weeks. And you might not just want to send them an email for one of these like top 1% of your customers that alone are driving 1% of your revenue. Like you want to pick up the phone, you want to do something special. Like if you think about things again in that customer obsessed way, there's a lot of revenue at the table there. And so you want to be well-timed and you want to be really, you want to put a lot of effort into 
keeping that super engaged base super engaged. And, and it goes similar to one to two time buyer program. I talked, you will never fix your one time buyer program with a post purchase trigger. It's just not enough, right? You have to think of it as a series. You have to think of introducing customers to your brand. And it's hard because you have a lot of different types of customers, right? You don't just have one customer. You have some customers who buy this collection of products and some customers who buy that collection of products. But there are ways to infuse customer insights into your email program and think of it as a month long welcome series and different welcome series, different strokes for different folks. These are, again, they're areas that because it's been hard on the technology front to do things more sophisticated for so long, most brands have a very straightforward approach and we see huge gains when you, when you kind of take advantage of the latest analytics that integrate with your marketing tools. And finally, promotions. This is like the CFO's favorite thing, right? And, and, and this is the thing of like, Oftentimes, the only way that a retailer tries to drive order frequency is by using promotions, but it's a kind of short-sighted. You know, I, I often talk about the Groupon phenomenon, right? Where, boy, we were focused with acquiring customers. And so we ran this Groupon and it was 90% off. And we acquired so many customers and we lost money on every single one of them because it was 90% off and none of them came back. But boy, do we acquire a whole lot of customers, right? That's like promotion to acquire customers, doesn't make sense. Same thing with driving repeat purchases. So there's a place for it, that we all know them. Some of us are them, we're coupon clickers. We only buy when things are on steep discount. When we go into the store, we go straight to the discount rack in the corner. But we all know people, other people are different. Some of us are them. We never go to that discount rack. That's the stuff nobody else wanted, not my style. I want the latest, right? Well, you got customers who are more full price, give me the latest, give me the new arrivals. And you got customers who are more now, now, I love the coupon rack. It's not good, bad. Again, different strokes for different folks. We celebrate all types of customers. But um, you can think about that as you're doing your marketing, right? Don't just use this brute force, everyone's getting 30% off today because we've got to move the needle. Don't train your new arrival people. I mean, there's multiple reasons. Don't train them that you're just, you know, a discount, discount brand. You're kind of eroding that, that, that notion that, our products are worth that full price, but also you don't need it to drive frequency. And so there are a lot of ways that we have seen, you know, you kind of add these things together, smarter calendar optimization, smarter life cycle segmentation. We didn't even put some of the big ones on here, like smarter acquisition, that Groupon thing, right? Put your acquisition dollars into channels that attract high repeat purchase customers. We haven't even talked about infusing customer insights into the call center, into your daily email personalization. There's really so many things where customer insights can uptick the engagement, the relevance, the experience that your customers get. In sum, these are the things that drive growth. And like the number one takeaway, if there's to be one, that um, from what we have seen is there is no silver bullet. You really need that mindset of if we're gonna be customer obsessed, we have to think about this thing holistically. All right, so um, we talked about a couple of these things just now, but maybe to get a little bit more detailed, you know, I, I mentioned this now twice today that the volume of customer acquisition on its own isn't necessarily a driver of growth, but boy, do companies grow well when they, when they think about acquiring the right type of customers. And again, look, if you're an established brand that's been around and already every single customer is a customer, right? Like all, all of America is a customer. Maybe acquisition isn't as high up on your list. But for the majority of brands, there's a whole lot of new customers to acquire. And I'll, I'll, uh, that Groupon example has a, an analogy in you know, digital marketing as well, right? Think about the type of customers you acquire on a coupon affiliate site, right? They're discount hunters. Now, sometimes you need discount hunters. They're good to clear out inventory, et cetera, et cetera. But you're not they're not really the ones that, for most brands that are gonna, you know, you're not gonna, grow your business significantly because you got more people go that you're finding new customers on these affiliates that are really focused around, you know, give me 30% off. You're much more likely to find high quality customers when you do things like uh, today, there's like, you know, look, look at Facebook. Instead of simply targeting on interests, you know, I kind of think that people who love the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be awesome customers and they're going to love, you know, my product too. You might be right, the Eagles are awesome. I don't know anything that goes wrong with the Eagles, but perhaps an even better 
ROI generating um, high value customer acquisition campaign would be to say, hey, Facebook, here's a list of my highest value customers. Facebook, can you use your machine learning, call it artificial intelligence, whatever you want, and find more customers that you see statistically are similar to this group, right? You're kind of seeding what they call a lookalike audience, but it's driven off of the real hard stuff, right? The seed is here are my best customers. Maybe it's even better. Here are my best customers that buy denim. Here are my best customers that buy cashmere. Now you start, you know, you're layering on these customer analytics and taking advantage. Facebook's got like, you know, a really big team of data scientists. They're very good at the lookalikes, right? Finding a way to fuse those things together you will find you will find better ROAS in the short term. Just immediately, you're gonna you're gonna get more response for your dollar, and it's the gift that keeps giving because you're gonna find customers that then spend more next month and the month after and the month after, and that compounds, right? Like like stop and think about that for a minute, right? We're all so obsessed. What's my ROAS? What's my ROAS? Right? What's my return on my ad spend on Facebook or on display? Well, when you actually target an audience filled with your high value customers, number one, the immediate ROAS is better, right? Because the people care. You're doing a better job finding people that care. The reason that they're your high value customers, that seed audience, is they care about your stuff, right? So you're putting your ad impressions in front of people who care. Step one, great, your ROAS is a lot higher. But when you start doing that, and those customers are the ones who come back month after month after month, next month you're earning the ROI again and again and again, right? So like, Again, why does order frequency drive growth? You know, you can think of when you when you put the right people into your customer mix, they just keep ordering and ordering, and it drives the average up. And so, there's so many ways to do this now. It's act like as a marketer, you've got more uh, more more avenues to do this kind of marketing. You've got Facebook, you've got display, you've got search. All this talk about first party data onboarding, you can think of it as it's like opening up the way for you to do really targeted, interesting, high value lookalike campaigns. And everybody should be doing it because it performs really, really well. Um, okay, so a few case studies and we'll get into some questions. Uh, and cool. Um, customer obsessed case studies. So here's this uh, <clears throat> one of the companies that we've been fortunate to work with for a good period of time, but um, really nice case study with Tiffany's. And, and you know, if you kind of look back to some of the stuff that, um, that I was talking about in terms of optimizing the calendar. And again, every retailer is unique. A brand like Tiffany, very prestige brand, catalog mail is still a fundamental part of, of the business. Um, that is a big event to optimize for, right? Jewelry buyers aren't the ones that are there every single week, right? But like um, you put a lot of time and energy and print costs into producing these things. It's a really, really nice opportunity to leverage customer insights. And by doing so, by leveraging those insights, Smarter segmentation, who's gonna respond, looking at the high value customers, thinking about the products, think about this build of the program, you know, the build of the, the creative and what you focus on as well as who gets it. Super, super significant things. This is one of many things that Tiffany does, but but we like it because it's like, you know, again, you think so much about the digital, but even sometimes the direct, you know, the print media still goes a long way and can be significantly improved. Just traditional direct marketing channels leveraging more current machine learning and segmentation techniques. Crocs. Crocs is a, has a superb marketing team. Um, if you had asked me 10 years ago if that would be true, I would have scratched my head not having a lot of experience in retail and with marketing technology because I just knew Crocs as super comfortable shoes. I'm actually wearing some right now. Um, but you know, under the surface here, there is a team that is super, super savvy. And when we talk about the ability to leverage these customer insights to find more customers that uh, have that high order frequency. They have seen magnificent results bridging the gap into Facebook and into display. Like upticks of ROAS like you wouldn't believe. Now, the caveat there, because I hate when, you know, I, I can't on the one hand talk, you know, about how marketing vendors like, you know, kind of self-deprecatingly mock that and on the other hand, throw a big stat like 40X and keep a straight face. <clears throat> when, if you think about first party targeting on something like display, it performs really well, right? It, you're take, instead of targeting on what some third party cookie web thinks is a yacht lover and therefore may or may not like Croc shoes, you're targeting people that you know like certain product categories and it works. And it works when you're targeting specific users at this magnitude. 
maybe 40x better than the um, than like a third party t campaign. However, let's get real. The the reality is you're also targeting a spot few users. That third party yacht loving, wine club loving, you know, like think about all those cool segments, gold moldies, mosaics, all those things you use to target on your display campaigns, what they have going for them is vast reach, right? The ad tech ecosystem has been building those cookie pools for decades. And so you've got like the fact that you can get a huge, huge lift in a small subset of users is meaningful. But if you crank on the lookalike capability, which a lot of DMPs and a lot of display ad tech folks are adding, you might not get 40x, but you still are going to have a huge uptick like the stuff we see in Facebook and you can get the reach. So just to contextualize that a little bit, but um, you can see here the quote from Crocs, like, you know, leveraging the lifetime value, leveraging better targeting, huge improvements in these channels that you're spending a whole lot of money in and it moves the needle for growth. Uh, and finally, Eloquy. Eloquy is one of the brands we've been working with for a long time, just a phenomenal team, a phenomenal brand, and they've seen so much lift and they're a, a, a perfect prime of example of what we would think of as the customer obsessed because they leverage these insights all over the place, right? We talk about the call center, we talk about direct mails, we talk about emails, you talk about, you know, you name it, there's an opportunity for, you know, to know, hey, someone's calling the call center. Are they one of those top 1%, top 10% customers? Because, you know, it's a, uh, uh, maybe you uh, you roll out like the, the the prestige service, or they cut the line, or you give perks to folks that way. Who knows, right? Um, maybe you pick up the phone and you realize, wow, like we're losing some customers now. Or these customers aren't you know, they used to buy four times a year, now they're only buying twice a year. Well, service that because we should pick up the phone and call those people and learn about it. You know, a great example of uh, of leveraging insights everywhere and. Tactically here, we're kind of profiling some things where they went from that world of using a rules-based churn program, hasn't bought in 180 days, to a world where you're using the machine learning to find it right away. And they saw a huge uptick, 27% lifts, 15% revenue increase, you know, when they when they shift and, and start using smarter ways to identify up and coming VIPs and nurture them. Tons of these little stats. And again, one of these isolated things, right? A 27% revenue lift in my win back. It's good, but you know it's nice. It's gonna pay for your technology investment. It's not gonna move the needle. But you couple that with your 15% increase in another life cycle stage, and you couple that with a better customer experience in the call center, and you couple that with you know the list goes on. You know better, you know putting your acquisition dollars to acquire the right type of customers, and that's why you see a brand like Eloquy grow in the way that they are. All right, so. That was a mouthful, um, but um, we still have time, and I know that some questions have already been coming in. So uh, we're going to start to um, to to take some of those questions right now. Uh, the first one I've got here is um, kind of touching on that multivariate, tricky, gnarly thing of okay, wait. So you're telling me that driving frequency moves the needle, yet reactivation and retention don't. How come? So again, if for those of you who missed that part of the talk, look, improving retention moves the needle, yes. But what we're looking at is uh, very rarely do you find a firm where they've improved retention rate and they haven't improved the order frequency, right? The way to improve retention, it's usually not, it's, it's kind of like, here's a good analogy, breaking up, right? Um, think back to, to the relationship where you broke up with someone. Usually the way to save that relationship isn't after the fact to send the we miss you email. It kind of works sometimes, but a much better way is to keep it engaged and to keep it active, moving you know, from the beginning. And so what we find is that it is the firms that drive frequency that tend to also see the improvement in the customer retention rates as opposed to vice versa. Um, cool. So, um, uh, somebody said, um, hey, we left off conversion rate. How come? And it's a, it's a great point. So conversion rate, of course, conversion rate matters. Um, I think the big difference there, well, there's a couple of them. So conversion rate, um, you know, people, you can think of conversion rate in any of those mediums, right? Like what's my conversion rate converting people from email? What's my conversion rate converting people on site? All of these things of course matter. But what we're talking about here are the brands that are more sort of customer obsessed and improving on site conversion. There's, there's a lot of things that can go into that, right? Where, 
Um, hey, look, if you get into your site optimization, your site personalization platform, better customer insights, and you show more relevant stuff to your customers, you're going to improve your conversion rate. That is one piece of what you would do to hopefully drive frequency. It's one piece, right? Not everyone, first of all, comes to the site to buy. Some people are coming to the store to buy if you're, if you're you know, an omnichannel store. But, um, but of course, we by no means would say don't improve on-site conversion. Um, I think we would think of it more of the high order metrics are we need to get customers to convert more. And what's your problem? Is it that you're not even driving traffic in the first place? Are you driving traffic, but your conversion rates are too low? Like you're going to look at the whole funnel, but you think of it from like a customer first strategy. And, and this research was really about identifying customer metrics, not so much channel specific metrics that, that drive growth. Um, all right. So just flipping through, because we've got a whole bunch of questions here. Um, did all of the retailers in the data set have positive growth? No, absolutely not. I mean, we certainly work with a whole bunch of retailers that are growing very, very well. But of course, a lot of retailers are having problems right now. And revenues might be down. And, and those data points factor into the analysis as well. Um, did we see any examples of data sets where order frequency increased and revenue growth went down? I don't think so. But I'm kinda, I can validate that and follow up on that. But that, that's what we're talking about here. Right. So, so yes, the, the, what you're going to see with the uh, multivariate analysis is, you know, if we're saying that order frequency is the primary driver of growth, it means for the negative growers, you're not going to see as much positive coefficients in front of order frequency. Um, if you had one recommendation on what to do to improve order frequency, what would it be? <sighs> okay, so it's hard. Uh, every brand is a little bit different. I think, um, depending on what stage you're at, right, if you are an up and coming brand, um, I think one of the ways that you would, re that we would recommend would be to look at those customer acquisition channels and acquire the right customers. And maybe, you know, to, to kind of provide more color there, you know, maybe for a brand, like if your brand is the kind where 60, 70, 80% of your revenue 80, every single month is coming from new buyers, then I would say, look, the biggest thing you can do to drive growth is to get lifetime value on, get predictive lifetime value. Every time you get these new cohorts of customers in the door, figure out which ones are likely to be the great ones and put more money into the marketing channels acquiring them because your customer mix then is going to be filled with higher value customers, the ones that order a lot. It's going to be the biggest way that you can improve things. On the other hand, if you're a super established brand, right? Like if you're Amazon, you know, we don't work with Amazon. If you're Amazon, you're already working with like every single person in the country, more or less, right? Like customer acquisition, reallocating those dollars isn't going to make so much sense. The vast majority of revenue, I presume, from Amazon is coming from their existing customer base. So then you're going to look differently. You're going to say, okay, how do I keep these existing customers engaged? And then you want to think about scale, right? It could be so tempting to to get down and to think of like, I want this one spot campaign to perform better. I want this one spot campaign. But I think often what we kind of go through is some diagnostic, like, well, what is the health of your business in these different life cycle stages? Um, is churn a huge problem? What would the upside be if you save 1% more customers? How many more customers? How much revenue is it going to drive? What are you currently doing with your daily email personalization? Is there a huge way to boost that? Um, you know, the on-site example we just saw, if there, there I don't think there is a one size fits all strategy for improving retention in that matter. I think what we tend to do is kind of build a map of here's all the potential upside, all the potential opportunities, and let's chart them out with like your status quo, let's benchmark, uh, let's look at the level of effort given how your team puts together creative, your financial constraints, your operational constraints. Let's connect all these dots and build a game plan. So I wish I had like a, a like a knee jerk rule of thumb there, but um, Unfortunately, I think like driving engagement in the existing customer base, it isn't uh, isn't like um, you know like going to like there is no like magic uh, magic bullet there. Um, if if you wanted a rule of thumb, then maybe I would say first things first, focus on that like you know that top 10, 20 percent of your customer base, the ones who are engaged. Oftentimes, it's easier to drive incremental engagement from that group than it is to take like the total lapsed customers and like bring them back and it, it, like it, it, you often get more bang from the buck focusing on taking what's good and building on it. But again, every, every brand is a little bit different. Um, all right. So, uh, 
Okay, so we mentioned not offering promotions to brand new customers because we don't want to train new customers to expect these promos. What are our thoughts on um, when brands give a percentage off to join email lists? And that's a little bit different. So at least from what we've seen, right, the logic in the, hey, 10% off if you join our email list is a little bit different than you're going to perpetually you know, then if you just like slam customers with discounts every time they haven't purchased in 90 days, right? Because literally we work with brands where the MO is haven't bought 90 days, here's 30% off, right? That's what we mean by, by training. And, you know, it can be really hard to wean off of that because it, it, you know, the revenue impact of that thing, like you see it, right? So there's some short long-term buy-in and, you know, easier said than done. But email subscription widgets are a little bit different. There, what you're trying to do is open up a communication avenue. Right, so if that offer is very clear to say, look, effectively you're saying, hey, I would love the opportunity to chat with you. I think I'm gonna send you relevant stuff. Trust me, don't just trust me. Here's 10% off your next order to really trust me. Um, and if you then follow up with relevant emails, right, you're, it's almost like a, uh, uh, you can think of every customer in your population as having these different, you know, that like what what is their contactability status? Can we talk to them on email? Can we talk to them on Facebook? Can we send them the direct mails? You have different amounts of data on everyone, and you're basically making a trade for someone. Ten percent off your next item, and 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 now I can send you emails. Um, what you need to do with that is check, obviously you need to very closely monitor the opt-out rate of those people. If everyone opted into that uses 10% and then clicks unsubscribe, you're just giving away margin, right? And, and by the way, let's take a look at the email and see if we can get more relevant, leverage some customer analytics, get more relevant there. Uh, but, um, but assuming you're doing that, you know, then you, you would want to do the ROI analysis too. Like, it's often interesting, like customers you acquire via different channels, via different promos, via different tactics like this. Um, what you wanna do is track the, those cohorts over time. So do they behave the same way as our typical email subscribers do? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? But those folks might only be the coupon clippers or maybe those folks aren't gonna be quite as high value as the ones who organically sign up for this stuff on their own, but it still might be very valuable. So. We, uh, we don't, we would not have some blanket attitude of like never offer 10% off to sign up for an email list. We would just say, test it. Um, but I, I think it is absolutely in a different category than the, hey, you haven't bought anything in 90 days. Here's 95% off, like word, right? Um, cool, so somebody said go Patriots and my only response to that for the first time in my life as a Philadelphia Eagles fan is scoreboard. Cool, sorry, couldn't resist. Um, cool, so um, how are customer lifetime value and revenue growth related? Um, so a lot of the variables we put on the screen today, AOV, purchase frequency, you know, all that stuff, um, they are the kind of the building blocks of customer lifetime value, right, obviously. And so, um, um, what gets tricky about LTV and growth is, um, assume you are this brand new business and you're just really starting to take off. Um, generally speaking, early adapters to any new growing brand, and I'll, I'll say this, right, we don't work with a brand like Casper. We don't work with a brand like Warby Parker. But I would, you know, wager a dollar that their very first customers, those early adopters, because we've seen this across the board, right? In their first couple of years of business, the people who found them loved them, right? And so the lifetime value of those customers was great. Now those brands took off. Um, however, what's going to happen, like, you know, like, like now everybody knows about Warby Parker. It is undoubtedly true uh, if it is the, if they follow the same laws of all the brands we have worked with that today, the lifetime value is probably lower than it was when they had their first like six months of customers, right? Those people that were just dying for there to exist a Warby. And again, I'm not speaking out of any knowledge of their data, but broadly as brands grow from like early adopters to mainstream, you're going to attract a little bit more mainstream customers who may be the one or two time purchasers, not the, I want a pair of glasses every month kind of customers. So there you'd be like, well, the LTV is kind of lower a little bit, but it's vastly mitigated by the fact that customer acquisition numbers are through the roof. So, which is all just to say that sometimes like LTV as a function, you know, like it isn't enough to just answer stuff on its own. Um, it tends to be, LTV is obviously a North Star metric that we believe that every brand should very obsessively track. 
But when you want to get into the actions and the tactics that drive it, and when you want to get into the actions and the tactics that you can influence, there usually isn't like a one size, like this is my improved LTV campaign. Like there's certain strategies around driving frequency. There's certain strategies around driving AOV and improving the basket size. And so by and large, what we see is like track CLV, certainly track the lifetime value of the new customers you're acquiring, the total of what we would call customer equity that you're adding to your brand each month, right? Um, but in terms of like driving engagement, the submetrics are a little bit better. That's why we focused on them, um, particularly for this, uh, for this uh, research analysis. Um, we have one more question here, which was, are these the five metrics Castor thinks is most important? Um, yeah, I mean, I, we did leave off some metrics that I think for some brands are just absolutely mission critical, like the promo rate, like what percentage of gross revenue are we, you know, sending out in, in terms of promotion. But um, like there's, there is, a, a, you know, for some brands that's not really a thing, you know, and, and so, and, and again, just to be humble, we're not saying don't look at year over year sales. We're not saying don't look at sales by SKU, but if you're wanting to layer on customer metrics and you're also trying to balance like you heard earlier we drew this distinction like there are much better more precise ways to measure customer engagement and customer retention than a simple like bought 12 months ago and also bought this 12 months um, so there are quote better metrics but if you're talking about getting your organization to align around things that everybody can relate to that, that these basics rate of customer acquisition lifetime value of customers acquired uh, AOV, purchase frequency, retention, reactivation rates, those seem to be like the most common um, and for, for good reason. And, and so that's why we focused on them. Um, all right, we are just finishing up on time, uh, but uh, I hope this was helpful. In a webinar like this, obviously we're only touching the surface. Check out the customer growth index, you can download it on our site. If you are a brand, obviously that are that is interested in leveraging customer analytics all over your org that is that's why we live and breathe you know our whole goal is to help you improve customer relationships and we, there's so much more opportunity to do that across the whole marketing stack across all of your organization today we'd love to talk uh, but even if not if, if the research is cool and spread spread the word um, we'd love to contribute to the community we hope you had a good time uh, we'll probably send a feedback or survey um, and we're really all ears. So we want to try to do these research reports more often and um, you guys can only help us make it better. So please be honest and we really appreciate your time. Talk to you soon.